Well, hello, everyone. I have a question for you today. Have you ever thought about origins? Have you ever thought about the beginning of everything you see and everything you know? Well, hi, I'm Brian Ashpole, pastor right here at Honolulu Assembly of God in beautiful Honolulu, right next to world-famous Diamond Head. And let's think about that question. Where did everything come from? How did it all get here? Well, right now, there are only two options, either evolution or creation. Which one do you subscribe to? Well, creation says God spoke the word and it all happened. So, for example, one scientist insisted God has nothing to do with it. Birds are able to navigate when they migrate because they have a compass in their head. That's all. Then someone asked the scientist writing in the 1993 issue of Science Journal Nature, who sets the compass to adjust for the Earth's rotation? Well, the scientist replied, that remains a mystery. A mystery? Well, hey, I believe it's God. So we're in the series and about Genesis in the, in the beginning, God and Genesis, of course, the book of beginnings. And trust you're enjoying that. I know I am. Uh, the first book of the Bible, Genesis, is foundational. It's an understanding of the book of Genesis it is crucial, friends, to the rest of Scripture. For example, it teaches us about the origin of the universe, the origin of man, monotheism, the worship of the one true God who has the power to create everything you, that you see. It teaches about the, us about the relationship between God and nature, between God and man, and between man and man, and, and between man and nature. If there's no Genesis account, how do we understand cre the Creator? How do we understand the creation? How do we understand mankind, or sin, or providence, which is God's authority and His rule? The book of Genesis, the account of creation, is foundational to a proper Christian worldview. For example, uh, it should affect your your what you believe about abortion, euthanasia, the origin of marriage, purpose of marriage, uh, and it has an impact on ethical issues. Uh, for example, in science, cloning, editing the genome so you have the perfect child in others. Well, let's look at what the Bible says. And we're looking at Genesis chapter 1 and uh, reading the first 26 verses. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, now the earth was formless and empty, void, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God thought that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Verse 6, and God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so God called the expanse sky and there was evening and there was morning the second day. Verse 9, and God said, let the water and the sky be gathered to one place and let ground, dry ground appear. And it was so God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plant and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seeds according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit with seeds according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. Verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth to govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth all across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God saw... Uh, bless them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. Verse 24, and God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kind, livestock, creatures that move along the ground and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kind, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, 
and all over all the creatures that move along the ground. Well, we're going to look at three things today, all having to do with creation. Number one, the beauty of creation. Number two, the power of creation. And number three, the lessons of creation. Now, let's start with the beauty of creation. Friends, in the beginning, God created. And we see the intricate and complex design of creation implies the wonder of the creator. I have an article here, and it's, uh, it's, it's an excerpt from uh, Chuck Swindoll's his book, Make Up Your Mind. And he shares a, a, an interesting story. He said, a scientist once Suggest an interesting analogy to grasp the scene. Imagine a perfectly smooth glass pavement on which the finest speck can be seen. Then shrink our sun from 865,000 miles in diameter to only two feet and place the ball on the pavement to represent the sun. Step off 82 paces, about two feet per pace, and to represent proportionally the first planet, Mercury, put down a tiny mustard seed. Take 60 steps more, that's 120 feet, and for Venus, put an ordinary BB. Mark 78 more steps, put down a green pea representing Earth, green pea. Step off 108 paces from there, 260 feet, for, and for Mars, put down a pinhead, sprinkle around some fine dust for the asteroids, and take 788 steps more for Jupiter, place an orange on the glass at that spot. After 934 more steps, put down a golf ball for Saturn, now it really gets involved, Mark 2,086 steps more, and for Uranus, a marble, another 2,322 steps from there, and you arrive at Neptune, let a cherry represent Neptune. This will take two and a half miles, and we haven't even discussed Pluto. If we swing completely around, we have a smooth glass surface, five miles in diameter, yet just a tiny fraction of the heavens excluding Pluto. On the surface, five miles across, we have only a seed, BB, P, pinhead, golf ball, a marble, and a cherry. Guess how far we'd have to go on the same scale before we could put another two-foot ball to represent the nearest star. Guess, 700 paces, 2,000 steps more, 4,000. 400 feet? No, you're way off. We'd have to go 6,720 miles before we could arrive at that star. Miles! not feet. And that's just the first star among millions in one galaxy among perhaps thousands, maybe billions, and all of it in perpetual motion, perfectly synchronized, the most accurate timepiece known to man. What? Isn't that amazing? The universe is intricate, it's complex, such precision. Everything is in its place. If, it, you know, if everything got out of whack, you'd have another big bang. There's a beautiful sense of balance, friends, in Genesis chapter 1. We see over and over, God said, God said, God said, and it was so. So you have the first days of forming, uh, which is light, verse 3, water under it, and above the expanse, verse 7, dry ground, verse 9, and vegetation, verse 11. Then you have, then you have the days of filling, which is, for example, the sky is filled with light, water with animals, sky with birds, verse 21. Uh, land with animals and man, of course, verse 24 through 26. And we'll look more specifically at man next week. Now, can you imagine being a spectator on the days of creation, friends? God speaks the word and it is so. Boom! It happens. What an awesome sight. The Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. He's brooding over the waters. And it goes from emptiness and darkness and barrenness and death to glorious fullness and light and life and color, all the colors of the rainbow and so many more. That's the beauty of creation, friends. Let's think about the power of creation in the beginning, God created. Well, first of all, you have the complexity of the universe. Let me share one more thought from Chuck Swindoll, again from his book, Make Up Your Mind. He said, if it were possible to travel the speed of light, you could arrive at the moon in one and third seconds. <laughs> but continuing that speed, do you know how long it would take you to reach the closest star? Four years. What an incredible thought. He said, phenomenal isn't the word for it. No, God, all by chance, whom are you kidding? I honestly cannot think of a more erroneous thought than that. Wow. Who, you know, the, the universe is vast, it's huge. Who created the stars? Who formed it? Who started? You know, last week we looked at God started the star. Well, there's a man by the name of Sir Fred Hoyle. He lived in 1915 to... Uh, to 2001. He's an English astronomer who formulated the theory of stellar nucleosynthesis. In other words, 
the creation of a nuclear synthesis of chemical elements by nuclear fusion reaction with stars. In other words, this guy is not a naive science basher. He's, he knows what he's talking about. He said this, at a 1981 symposium, Sir Fred Hoyle uh, said, remarked this, and I quote, the chance that higher life forms might have emerged in this way, in other words, through evolutionary processes, is comparable with the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a Boeing 747 from materials therein, unquote. Wow. Hoyle further said, quote, he was at a loss to understand, unquote, the compulsion of evolutionary biologists, quote, to deny what seems to me to be obvious, unquote. In other words, that evolution was, was not tenable, it's not reasonable, it's not defensible. The record of Genesis 1, friends, is God spoke the word and it was so. Now, I don't understand everything of the details of creation, the fossil record, and all that, but I know that God is all-powerful. The Bible declares his creation, that he spoke the word and it was so, and we, we accept it. And last week we talked about the four arguments for the existence of God. God created the world out of nothing, friends. That's uh, the Latin word there is ex nihilo. The Hebrew word is bara. God created the world out of nothing. Verse 2 tells us the earth was formless and void and empty. Did God create it that way or did something happen to it? I don't know. This, the Bible, Genesis 1 speaks about six days of creation. How long was that? I don't know, 24 hours a day? Well, day and night weren't we're, we're here until the, first, until the first day when God spoke and created. Is the earth young or old? I don't know. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us. I only know what the Bible reveals. And as, I'm, as we looked at last week, the Bible is a master of un understatement. But friends, this is key. This is key. I want you to remember this. Science and the Bible are not incompatible. Science and the Bible are not incompatible. So often it seems like, well, hey, if you accept the Bible and not evolution, then you're a moron. But you don't have to check your brains when you become a Christian. Christianity and the Bible, they are both reasonable. Let me emphasize this, friends. Many scientific discoveries were made by Christian scientists. Major scientific discoveries were made by Christian scientists, people who believed in creation. Now, some of them during the Middle Ages had to go against the church. I understand that. But for example, Copernicus, you know, he was one. He, he got into a lot of trouble. He lived in the 1400s, say that the sun, well, not the earth, was the center. But he, was, he believed that God created all. Galileo, 1564, 1642, has been called the father of observational astronomy. Listen to this, friends, the father of modern physics, the father of the scientific method, the father of modern science. In 1623, he wrote the laws of nature written by the hand of God in the language of mathematics. Jean Picard lived in the 1600s, so obviously he's not the captain of the starship Enterprise. But he's the first person to accurately calculate the size of the Earth. His estimate was astonishingly accurate, within 0.44% of the actual value of what we know today. Carolus Linnaeus lived in the 1700s. He was involved in the study of taxonomy. Uh, he's one that came up with the biological classification system, the, the two Latin words that, that are the that describe every plant and every animal. Gregor Mendel, of course, in the 1800s were involved in genetics. A number of these were priests, friends. Charles Babbage lived in the 1800s also, considered the father of the computer. He insisted this, quote, there exists no fatal collision between the words of scripture and the facts of nature. He was persuaded by the argument of design that we talked about last time. Uh, and in the beginning of that study, and Babbage stated that studying the works of nature had led him to actively profess the existence of God. Giuseppe Mercalli lived in 1815 out of 1914 and came up with a scale for measuring earthquakes. It's still in use. It's the Mercalli scale. And George Lemaitre, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, is the father of the Big Bang Theory. He was a contemporary of Albert Einstein and based his theory on Einstein's theory of relativity. relativity. And of course, Sir Isaac Newton, I've saved him to last, widely recognized one of the most influential scientists of all time, a key figure, friends, in the scientific revolution. I came across a great story about him. And of course, he lived in the 18th, late 1600s, early 1700s. He had an exact replica of our solar system made in miniature. At its center was a large golden ball representing the sun and revolving around it were small spheres attached at the end of rods for varying lengths. 
They represented Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and the other planets. These were all geared together by cogs and belts to make them move around the sun in perfect harmony. One day as Newton was studying the model, a friend who did not believe in the biblical account of creation stopped by for a visit. Marveling at the device and watching as the scientists made the heavenly bodies move on their orbits, the man exclaimed, Newton, what an exquisite thing, who made it for you? Without looking up, Sir Isaac Newton replied, no one. No one, his friend asked. That's right, I said no one, replied Newton. All of these balls and cogs and belts and gears just happened to come together and wonder of wonders by chance, they began revolving in their set orbits and with perfect timing. Well, the unbeliever got the message. It was foolish to suppose that the model merely happened. But it is even more senseless to accept the theory of the Earth and the vast universe came into being by chance. How much more logical, logical to believe what the Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Newton himself, in his book, Principia, book three, said this, a monotheistic God, he saw a monotheistic God as the masterful creator whose existence could not be denied in the face of the grandeur of all creation. And so major discoveries, friends, have been made by Christians. For example, astronomy. Christianity made the exploration of the heavens possible because of science, belief, their conviction, and orderly creator. That God was orderly and therefore creation would be orderly. And so they observed the clockwork progression of stars. Now I came across at creation.com. I can give you the, the, the uh, link in the, in the description. Six presuppositions that undergird modern science from biblical Christianity. Uh, presuppositions or assumptions or belief. Number one, there's such a thing as objective truth. Number two, the universe is real because God created the heavens and earth. It's right here in Genesis chapter one. The universe is orderly because God is a God of order, not confusion. First Corinthians 14, 33. Knowledge, number four, knowledge about the physical world will be discovered by investigating and experimenting rather than relying merely on thought. For example, uh, that's in contrast to the ancient Greeks who uh, tried to discover everything through philosophy. Number five, man can and should investigate the world because God gave us dominion over his creation. We read that in Genesis 128. And number six, God, excuse me, man can initiate, can initiate thoughts and actions. Let me give you another quote, and this is Peter Harrison. A fresh appreciation of Bibles, the Bible's literal history in Genesis, including the fall of Adam, played a vital role in the development of the scientific method, the foundation of modern science. Peter Harrison, who is the Andreas Idris Professor of Science and Religion at the University of Oxford, very prestigious university, said this, quote, had it not been for the rise of the literal interpretation of the Bible and the subsequent appropriation of biblical narratives by early modern scientists, modern science may not have arisen at all. In sum, the Bible and its literal Literal interpretation have played a vital role in the development of Western science. Again, he's not a, not, not a naive science basher. He's one who's very much part of that. The truth, friends, is no one was there at the beginning. So faith is required no matter what you believe. Faith means to believe in something you cannot see. That's part of the definition. So whether you hold to creation or evolution, both of them require faith. So sure, creation requires faith. You, you believe the revelation that God has given us in the book of Genesis about what happened in creation, but also evolution requires faith. See, evolution says it's really all it's about science, but it's not really about science. It's, about, it's not about facts, but about the interpretation of facts. You know, for example, science is about something that's measurable and repeatable. Of course, this, uh, evolution is not. And as you remember what Sir Fred Hoyle said a little bit ago, so, for example, all cells come from previous ones, but where did the first cell come from? Well, evolution would say from the one before, but when did that happen? Well, God created it out of nothing. Evolution does not explain the origin of life, merely pushes it the beginning back a few billion years here and there and constantly need to revise events in time and need lots of time. The cell, consider the cell, the basic building block of humanity. I looked it up. The average body has about 30 trillion of them. Now, at first, the cell was considered to be a simple cell, and scientists have learned since it is anything but simple. It's very complex. It has code in it that's like software. Can you imagine software just appearing? When you see software, you know someone put it together. Even if one cell could evolve, friends, 
even if it could, it would die because it would be by itself. It need many, many more. 30 trillion, not, not million, not billion, 30 trillion to make up your body. So if, let's say you got enough cells to make up your big toe. What would happen to it? Well, if there's nothing else, it, it would die. Or a foot, or a leg, or a body. Let's say one human was able to evolve. Well, would that be male or female? See, you still have a problem because you need both in order to be able to reproduce. So, friends, maybe it's not so foolish after all to accept that God spoke the word and creation happened. And the Genesis account is the record of that. That's the power of creation. Let's look at the lessons of creation. I have a few here before we're going to go to prayer. And lessons of creation about who God is and uh, about God and who he is. Number one, God is mighty, friends. He's a great God. He's an awesome king. He created the world out of nothing. There is, and that tells us there is nothing he cannot do. He can make a difference in your life. He created the universe. He takes care of the universe. That means he can take care of you and me. God is mighty. The second one is God is sovereign. He's, what does that mean? God is sovereign. He's supreme. He's absolute. He's number one, numero uno. He made everything. He calls the shots. He has all authority. There's no room for bargaining with him. There's no bartering, no haggling, no negotiating. When you realize who he is, you, there, are only two really, there are really only two responses. You obey him and you worship him. God is sovereign. And because God is sovereign, God is in control. God is in control. A God who can create the world and the universe and everything else is an awesome God. Friends, it's exciting to see him work. It's amazing what he can do. He can do above and beyond what you and I could ask or even imagine. And he deserves all. He deserves everything. See, if you acknowledge creation, then you must acknowledge a creator. And if you acknowledge a creator, then you must acknowledge that you are part of his creation. And if you acknowledge that you're part of his creation, then you must acknowledge that you're responsible to him. You're his. He is sovereign. He's in control. And if you acknowledge, friends, that you're his, then you must acknowledge all he has said in the Bible is true. That there's sin. There's, we're sinners. We're in need of a savior. We need to respond to him. We need to surrender to him. That's why for some people, it's just safer to deny creation right from the start and be an evolutionist and atheist. Well, one of those guys, one of the evolutionists, one of those atheists is a man by the name of Richard Lumsden. I'd like to share his story before we go to prayer. And he lived from 1938, 1997, just, you know, just passed away uh, 23 years ago. He was a professor of parasitology and cell biology at Tulane University in Louisiana, where he also served as the dean of the Graduate School of Biological Sciences. After years of being a self-proclaimed atheist and professor of evolutionary theory, Lumsden began doubting his long-held evolutionary worldview. He dogmatically taught evolution to his classes until one day a student politely asked him a number of pointed questions. She asked him questions such as, how does evolution fit with the fundamentals of information theory? Aren't the odds of random assembly of genes mathematically impossible? Last month you showed us how mutations were genetic disasters. How, with regard to natural selection, could mutations randomly produce new and better structures and improved species? Where exactly in the fossil record is the evidence for progressive evolution, the transitional forms between major groups? Well, initially, Lumsden dogmatically defended evolution, trying his best to answer her questions, but something about this interchange, friends, began making him very uneasy. He was prepared for a fight, but not for a gentle, honest set of questions. As he listened to himself spouting the typical evolutionary responses, he thought to himself, this does not make any sense. What I know about biology is contrary to what I'm saying. When the time came to go, the student picked up her book, smiled, Thanks, Doc, and left. On the outside, Lumsden appeared confident, but on the inside, he was devastated. He knew that everything he had told his, this student was wrong. After an honest evaluation of the issues, he eventually concluded that evolution was scientifically bankrupt. This is what he said, and I quote, I realized that the origin and diversification of life by evolution was a mathematical, physical, and biochemical impossibility, that the evidence for it was at best circumstantial, and a lot of what we really knew about biology was outright contradictory to the hypothesis, unquote. Based on the scientific evidence alone, he decided he must reject Darwinism, and he became a reluctant creationist first and later a Christian. 
He went on to teach creation at two Christian institutions before he died in 1997. Most of this is from his article or book, I'm not sure which one it is, the Richard Lumsden pro professing to be wise as scientists Sal uh, salvation uh, that was un unpublished, uh, he wrote in Los Angeles in 1994. Also can be found at factsoffaith.com, and I can put the link in the description also if you're interested in that. Friends, God is sovereign. He's in control. You know, you look up to the stars in the sky, go out at night, and you see them in their order. If God can form them, if he can direct them, if he can take care of them, keep them in place, he can certainly take care of you. He's powerful. Let him have control of your life. And we're going to go to the Lord in prayer in just a moment. And maybe you're hearing this for the very first time. If you don't know Jesus as your king and as your master, I invite you to surrender your life to him. Let him become your Lord and Savior, friend. Right? There's nothing greater that could happen to you than surrender yourself to the creator, the master of the universe. If he can create everything, if he can take care of everything, he certainly can take care of you. Maybe you've served him in the past and you've gone away from him. I invite you, I urge you to come back to him. Surrender your life completely to him. You know, why try to control your own life when you're not able to? I'm not able to. None of us are able to, but he can. He can, he can guide you and take care of you and direct you. And I want to encourage you, maybe you're serving the Lord and you're passionate about living for him. Friends, you're serving the one in control. He spoke the word and worlds were formed. There's nothing too hard for him. Nothing in your life, nothing in your family, nothing in your needs, your job, your future, whatever it is. Give it all to him. Give it all to him. So we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Are you ready? Let's do that now. God bless. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. The fact that you are powerful and mighty, you're sovereign, you're in control, Lord. We don't have to worry about things in our life because, Lord, you, you have created everything. You keep, it in, you keep it in place, Lord. Your word tells us that you sustain everything. You maintain everything. Lord, if you can do that for this universe as vast and mighty, as magnificent as it is, Lord, you can certainly do that in each one of our lives. So I pray for every man and woman, young person, boy, every girl watching this right now, Lord, wherever they are, wherever they are, uh, physically, but more important, wherever they are spiritually, Lord, in relation to you. I pray that they would look to you, Lord, maybe give their life to you for the very first time, or surrender their life to you, Lord, or have confidence in knowing that you're in control. Lord, I pray for salvation that for those that need it, that they would look to you and say, yes, Lord, be my Lord and Savior. Father God, you made everything. I put my life in your control. Lord, those that have walked away from you, may they come back to you and say, I want to surrender my life again to you and live for you. Lord, for those that are serving you, may they have great confidence that you're in control. Lord, there's nothing that's going to happen no matter what's happening in our lives, in our homes, in our families, in our city, in our state, in our country, Lord, in our world, no matter what's happening. You're in control. We can trust in you. I pray, thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, friends, God bless you, and Jesus loves you. Aloha, and aloha keakua. God loves you. God is love. Well, there's more good teaching coming up here next time, so I want to see you then. Uh, until then, God bless. Aloha. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.